Hey guys. So one of the interesting things about being an American voter in the year 2019 um, is that three years after the presidential election, which was influenced by uh, the Russian government, although it's multiple governments and multiple private actors as well, uh, we I think the younger generation in America might finally realize that their that their perception of different countries is really based on a semi-secretive process where um, through black box budgeting, uh, you know, other people and other agencies determine what they see. And these days with digital sort of um, manipulation, I mean, that's, that's, that's a harsh word, but we'll go ahead and call it for what it is. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll say that, you know, these days, all you have to do is master SEO. And if you master search engine optimization, you know, which isn't that difficult, it, it takes only a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, you know, ultimately all what ends up happening is, you know, you end up being sort of host. Again, I'm using harsh language here and I shouldn't do that you, because, and the reason I shouldn't do that is because, you know, ultimately it, it's, it's not, you have to consider the alternative. What if you, you don't have government agencies and state actors and billionaires, you know, you know, trying to influence you, uh, then that, you know, people do not try to influence you. And this is the premise behind Citizens United that the Supreme Court case that allowed a lot of money, including super PACs, um, to remain semi-anonymous, depending on which subsection of the IRS code they're, they're under. The idea is if they don't, you know, if Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, does not get to use his billions of dollars, uh, or Starbucks, the corporation itself, does not get to use that money to try to influence you and your thinking, then ultimately all you're doing is allowing foreigners or, or smaller actors or the, just the government itself, like, you know, namely the CIA, um, or you know, CIA funded ventures such as um, Facebook, at least in its inception. Uh, it was funded partly by a, um, the VC arm of the CIA called NQTEL. Um, you can look that up, you know, and so ultimately, you know, you have to consider this, 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 this system where if you're not involved, if you're not, you know, if you're not actually in the game, what you're doing is you're ceding territory, intellectual territory, mental territory, psychological territory to someone else. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have to be hostile to you. Um, you know, ultimately they could be friendly, but they just might be in a, in a position where they don't know what they're talking about. So you have to consider all of this from that background. Ultimately, you have to be in the game, and if you're not in the game, you allow other people to come in. That's actually, if you think about it, for in terms of you know war, that 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 explains why we, the United States, got into the into the uh, Vietnam War. The idea being that if if we, the Americans, did not go there, then the Chinese would come in. Now they won, they're there. You know, all these people died, and and quite frankly, they appear to have died for no reason. Um, and, and that's something we have to struggle with today. Whether or not you've lost a family member or a friend in that war, you know, it really does seem as if the person that was most salient, that was most, um, you know, that was most percipient about the consequences of that war was somebody that did not go to college, uh, and that was Muhammad Ali. Um, and so you have to sort of, you know, understand, number one, that just having access to information doesn't make you smarter, doesn't make you more right. Uh, it may, it, in many cases, if you're not getting the right information, or at least you're not getting the right information in a way that makes you more and more humble over time, you very well could end up, you know, being better off without an education, um, a formal education, I mean. So let's back up to what I was trying to say earlier, now that we have a background in terms of how this strategy works out for all of us. And, and none of us, are, you know, is immune unless you end up in a village or, or a mountaintop somewhere. Um, you know, we want to read. And, you know, if you notice from a, and I digress again, but, you know, if you look at older movies from the 40s, 50s, 50s and 60s, the dialogue was better. It was just, a, you know, the actresses were better. Um, Audrey Hepburn, even Marilyn Monroe, who's derided as a, a sort of a, 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 a somebody who's not intellectual, was actually an amazing actress. Um, if you go back and look and, and partially deaf, uh, raised, I think, in a, in, a, in a home for orphans. I mean, just an incredible history. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of these people end up sort of, you know, expiring too early. And that's another thing that's very strange. Um, so whether it's, you know, Marilyn Monroe all the way up to Michael Jackson, all the way, I mean, it's just unbelievable. So, um, and I, I apologize for digressing. So let me get back to my original point, which is, so everything you see is propaganda in some way. And even if it's not being paid for by a foreign government, and the reason for that is I am the sum of all the information that I've received from day one. If I have a photographic memory, then I'm really the sum total of almost everything. Whereas most people, 
um, you know, can sort of parse, they forget things, or they're not able to synthesize the information. You know, in, 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 in the abstract, you know, philosophical sense, you can very much see that all of us, in some sense, even if we can't overtly memorize everything, everything we've seen, our subconscious picks it up. And so that's why advertising is so effective, is that it really rel- p- preys on our subconscious as opposed to the conscious mind. So, you know, fear, all this stuff, right? Uh, xenophobia, et cetera. And that's why it's always been so effective, because that, that human source code has a flaw. And part of it is just the inability to get objective information. So that goes back to a philosophical question. So if I'm the sum of all my experiences, I've, I've only seen one tiny, tiny drop in the entire world, in the entire human history, not even a drop. Uh, you, it, it would be so small, it would be smaller, uh, you know, it would be microscopic. And even that would be, you know, giving it too much of a, much of a size. And the reason for that is humanity is only, is, is, is very old, the world is very old, and if, if all you've seen is, is, is a sliver of a moment in time compared to a whole history, you can see that anybody can really manipulate what you see based on their own projection or their own access to information, whether it's in, in, in the form of an archive, whether it's in the form of a small manufactured movie uh, that may be passed on as true when in fact it's just an acting situation. Um, I mean, we don't know at this point because our, again, our source code is, is designed to be trustful of information that we see, unless it's, a, it, un, I mean, even if it's in a movie section, and when we see it, I mean, of course, we're thinking to ourselves, all right, you know, this is something that's, even if it's a movie, or, it's, or if it is a movie, we're looking at it and we're thinking to ourselves, well, this is objective. Somebody here is not trying to lie to me. But again, what we're seeing is also the sum of that person's experiences in a sort of cellophane or a sort of visual format. And so that person's experiences get transferred onto you. And one of the interesting things about humanity is that that's what makes it so special is that we can sort of transfer um, like Rogue and X-Men. We can try to transfer without touching each other, without sort of physically being there, uh, the sum total of our, of our experiences, which ultimately are, are subjective, onto somebody else. That's what, may, that's what makes us such good storytellers, as opposed to many other species uh, that get along just fine, that are probably more advanced than we are in many ways. But that one thing... That, that ability to, to project our emotions and our uh, the sum total of our experiences onto somebody else without needing to be there is responsible for a lot of our progress. And unfortunately, remember that, that flaw in our source code, um, it's also the source of a flaw in the sense that if I give you enough bad information or enough, and it doesn't have to be bad, again, I'm, I'm trying not to be judgmental, if, if I give you enough uh, biased information, and it doesn't, and again, I don't know I'm biased because nine times out of 10, I've stayed in one country or I've only been to less than 10% of the countries in the world. I'm hostage to a situation where I'm dependent on other people's thinking and other people's experiences, especially with the slow decline of, of, of in-person investigative journalism um, and interviews and so on. And so when we think about all these things, right, it actually does make a little bit of sense or it, it, it makes sense from a uh, one perspective to say that we should have a benevolent agency or a benevolent billionaire trying to influence what we see, because if we don't, someone else would get in there and create fake news and so on. And the reason this is interesting and and important is not only because of our our innate desire or our innate predilection for storytellers and storytelling. Um, It's interesting because I'm hoping the the younger generation now sees three years after the election that a lot of what they see is ultimately based on you know, what the government or what private billionaires are, or just anybody, right? Anybody funded by the new regime or the new political structure uh, wants you to see. And we know that because suddenly all these comedians are getting on, on you know, all these talk shows uh, with stories. And this, this one comedian only has one story about being on a train that he robbed uh, with a Russian mob. And that's all he has. And suddenly he's like on, on all the shows. That was how that happened a while ago. Um, that's one example. And suddenly, of course, you never saw somebody like this. He's been doing the same thing over and over again for many years. Now, suddenly, he's on primetime TV or, or just on late night television. So we see that. We see a lot of different things about, you know, suddenly I'm seeing um, on, on Netflix, a uh, streaming video, all these different, you know, allusions to Russians. I'm seeing suddenly uh, a very, you know, Russia is, is one of the best countries in wrestling. I'm seeing a lot of them, uh, a lot of famous wrestlers suddenly on my on my feed, uh, in, in not just on my feed, but in just normal comedy skits. And uh, this is not something you would see. Right? If, if, if suddenly our government was influenced by Bulgaria, a smaller country, 
So it's a bad example. Suddenly, it wouldn't be out of the question, I think, that to suddenly see all these Bulgarian authors and Bulgarian poets suddenly coming to your feed. And that's what I think people need to realize, especially the younger generation, that when you have an election, a lot of it is really based on maintaining the, the legitimacy of that election after the fact. And the way you do that is you essentially, and not just because you're paying for it, right? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if, if I'm if I'm South Africa or something, right, I, and I'm trading with the U.S. Uh, and, you know, X billion dollars a year, it doesn't. It's it's a good investment to spend, you know, one billion or a hundred million dollars trying to make sure that that trade agreement doesn't get subject to outside influence that would harm me. And we know that, you know, South Africa, obviously, the, the, the difficulty, obviously, is if, if you're old South Africa and you're doing something that's fundamentally wrong, you know, at some point, the propaganda is so divorced from reality that you have a substance problem. And then the whoever's in office um, loses credibility. And if enough people figure that out, um, suddenly we have a strange system where we have a political system that's designed to sort of change allegiances every four years. When in fact, a lot of the money keeps going to the same places, but the personnel changes and it's on the national level in many cases, although not really in Congress, the tenure is about nine years, um, seven to nine years. So you look at that and, and even then you're looking at a transfer. So you're looking at a situation where the objective is no longer the truth, but it's not necessarily because money is involved, although that's obviously a part of it. The real the reality of the situation is whoever gets into office, right, is chosen in part because they succeeded in influencing you. And suddenly, in order to justify that influence, you have an after the fact um, manipulation. And my problem is, you know, you know, I, I really love the fact that human beings are, are great storytellers, but I also think that we should be after the truth in order to, and the way to get there is simply like, you know, as I said before, is to realize that all we're seeing, everything we see is propaganda, even if we think, even if we don't think so. And the reason for that, again, is that all we're able to project is the sum total of our own experiences. And if you only speak one language, first of all, you're already you know, millennia behind everyone, you know, in terms of trying to get access to information because you're dependent on another person being an intermediary and translating for you. And let me tell you right now, I've never seen a good translation. 2019, um, I think that uh, Larry Page of Google uh, has been on this project for many, many years now um, based on his comments at a shareholder meeting. And it's 2019 now, many years later, I have yet to see a good translation. The most famous, let me give you an example. The most famous Japanese author is Marikami. But the reason he's famous is because he actually wrote in his second, in his second language, English, which was then, I mean, it was it's strange. He actually wrote in English, then translated it to Japanese. Uh, but in order to, you know, and, and that's why he's, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, he's so popular is because when you, when you translate that back, I mean, when you translate all these different things, there's not as much lost in translation. But I actually don't think Marikami is that good. I, I mean, I, there are so many poets and authors where I, I do, I've do i picked up a little bit of Spanish, and now I'm able to go back and say, holy cow, I've just, suddenly I'm discovering all these you know, Spanish-speaking poets. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I for example, I was in Berkeley the other day for a book festival, and they have, they've had these poems on the sidewalks for many, many years. And, you know, and I've been in California for a long time, uh, decades. And suddenly, for the first time, I see a poem that's partially in Spanish, and I think to myself, this is the best poem here. I mean, there's about 25 of these little poems, and this is the best one here. And I realized, wait a second, if I'd seen this five years ago when my Spanish was, you know, minuscule, I wouldn't have, I, I don't think I would have, you know, been able to appreciate it. So suddenly, it's not just what you see that's being presented to you, it's also what you know that's enabled, that allows your brain to absorb somebody else's ex experiences in the way closest to how they experienced it. And so that's the power of storytelling is that the more authentic it is, the more you can empathize. And the farther away you move from that authenticity, the more things like humility and empathy become difficult. And that's where we are today, uh, everywhere in the world, I think, except for villages and mountaintops. And the real question I think we ought to think about is how do you, how do we, how do we make a U-turn? And I, I think it's gonna be very difficult with all the trillions of dollars in debt that are linked to this political system of, of manipulation that I just talked about. And the question is, you know, but at least I have hope because the youth can now see, hey, you know, if I was like 16, I didn't see anything about Russia coming in my feed or in my movies or anywhere. Suddenly I'm seeing all this stuff coming in and I'm hoping more people can make that connection. Um, and when they get older, they can sort of start putting together all these different dots on how it's important to be 
more, not skeptical, but it's important to understand that at the end of the day, you know, what we see is, is becoming more and more catered or curated for you. And that, does, and that means that you just have to get your stuff out there as much as possible uh, to try to counteract what you see. And maybe you just got to go back to reading books uh, from people that are authentic. And uh, we already know Anthony Bourdain is, is just, you know, and Chris Rock. These are all people that started out as dishwashers and suddenly, like Muhammad Ali, despite a lack of a formal edu uh, uh, education, are probably the smartest, were probably, you know, in Anthony Bourdain's case, were uh, probably the smartest people in America today. And they're obviously being promoted. And so some, sometimes promotion works, sometimes it doesn't. But hopefully, you know, we'll all figure these things out and um, have some more um, you know, humility, I think. And if we can get there, then maybe there's hope. You don't necessarily have to do a U-turn uh, to get there, um, but it helps. And we'll see how things go. And I've spoken too much. Uh, that's it.